Welcome everyone, Christine here with a discussion about the dwarves and their new research tree in Total War Warhammer 3, Thrones of Decay, and how to handle this research tree as it is, like what you should prioritize from my personal perspective on this. You've got two major tabs. You've either got guilds or you've got clans. Both of these have certain research that does require oath gold. And you will want to do this research, not necessarily because of the benefits that that particular piece of research will grant, but rather because there's different tiers of research. So for both of these trees, you have initial tier that you unlock uh, with uh, one initial research, either marching songs or the way of the guilds. And then you have tier two, which requires seven uh, seven pieces of research for both of them, and then tier three, the final tier, which requires five additional pieces of research from tier two. That is how things are unlocked. Now, clans buff military units. Going over it, you start with movement speed, you get recruitment costs for infantry units, and then you get different things for different units. At the top over here, for clans in the first tier, you get various benefits for melee units, so dwarf warriors and long beards, including the very powerful shield wall ability. Certainly, really useful in terms of survivability, benefits for miners, melee benefits for miners, uh, long beard. So you got either sword uh, and axe infantry benefits over here with long beards, or two handed weapon benefits over here. And in the middle, down the middle, you get some minor benefits. At the bottom, you get the various range benefits, uh, specifically thunderers and quarrelers iron drake, uh, and iron drakes over here in this particular situation. And also a ranger benefit uh, right down the middle, or ranger benefits in general, though not just ranger benefits, also quarreler benefits. Then we go into warrior guild, gives you unit experience for infantry units. At the very top, we can talk about benefits for iron drakes and hammer units, benefits for slayers and slayer onslaught, and in the middle, rune magic benefits. At the very bottom, we're talking about artillery benefits, uh, hero benefits in the middle, and then gyrocopter and flying units in general. And at the end, then really you should prioritize getting to the end of each tree as quickly as possible above everything else because the stuff there is incredibly powerful. You get Age of Reckoning Grudge Seller Army Size. So the army that spawns when you fill up an Age of Reckoning increases by two. This is incredibly powerful because we're talking slightly better units of the default ones. And you're talking things like hammers, long beards, quarrelers, grudge throwers, flame cannons, iron drakes. You can defeat legendary lords with Grudge Seller Army. I've done that in multiple campaigns, manually fighting them. Um, then you get a minus 5% upkeep for all units, and then call an oath, Grudge Seller unit capacity per army. Grudge Seller capacity means that the number of units in an army, the red units if you will, you can get 6 as opposed to 5. There are other ways to increase this as well, through legendary grudges, uh, so specifically the one grudge that you're looking at in order to increase that grudge seller unit capacity is the Crooked Moon. There's also a certain skill line, if I am not mistaken over here. Uh, you can also increase Age of Reckoning grudge seller army size by free with Forgrim's uh, specific skill line over there. So there's various skill lines that do give you certain benefits in certain campaigns. But regardless of that, for all the military benefits, I'd personally argue very firmly in favor of the clans. Because the dwarves have never had an issue with their army being weak. It's always been issues of casualty replenishment, issues of growth, issues of income. And that's where the guilds really shine. Starting with the first tier, you'll get diplomatic relations and growth which means that, yeah, you're going to already start in a pretty good position in terms of your growth. But then things will get a lot better. 
One of the things I would prioritize getting very quickly is rat poison. You look at storage vaults, you don't care about the defense buildings, but you do certainly want rat poison. 5% faction-wide casualty replenishment is pretty significant, especially because, be it if you recruit a lord or a rune lord, there is a skill, in the case of rune lords, a choice of a skill, though I would recommend getting it, that also gives you 5% casualty replenishment. Dragons, uh, demon slayers don't have that, they focus on Slayer Replenishment, so keep that aspect in mind, but you can get the Dragon Slayer Replenishment Hero in the army and it will mesh very well. Uh, down the middle path for the first tier, in the upper part of the guilds, you get construction time for Provincial Capital Settlement Buildings at the very top after you get construction costs and income. The These two are not particularly worth it, but this one is exceptional because it means you can get all your settlements that are constructing, you can do it faster. And keep in mind, there are other benefits that you can get in terms of construction cost that end up being very powerful. Uh, you can also get benefits for construction time for military recruitment buildings and support buildings. Support buildings basically are advanced military buildings, so things like rangers, uh, artillery buildings, flying unit benefits, all of those are available through there. At the bottom, you get benefits for different kinds of resources. So more income, basically, trade resources produced. I would not prioritize the bottom stuff. And when it when we're talking about research, you do want to get the stuff with Oath Gold, even if it's not particularly useful, because it can be done in one turn. So over here, it would take eight turns to get Kazid subsidies. Keep in mind, there's still archivists and students in the game that you can get even if they are still limited and there's since there's so much stuff that you can actually do instantly you may get still end up getting a bunch of students and archivists though yeah that's certainly been nerfed the stuff at the bottom is more like economic benefits so i would not necessarily prioritize that i'd prioritize the top and first tier moving on to underway caravans campaign movement range cooldown for underway tra network travel minus two turns uh this is something that you need to unlock by restoring the realm. Basically, this initial grudge over here to essentially be dealing with Skarsnik, with Scrag, because he's going to push on Barakvar, Warzag, probably, most likely, um, Quee, Clan Verms, and so on. Um, but at the top, you get benefits in terms of recruitment, so and various hero benefits in both the top and the bottom. One of the things I would prioritize here, like obviously Oaths of Loyalty is pretty useful and it does take one turn. So you're going to need five pieces of research. And so to get to this top one, it's going to take 31 turns with the default research rate. Keep in mind, you can increase that research rate as well because you can get Tinkers then for engineer capacity. And you can get, and you may, and you will want to get to a lot of that. So. It might take like 45 turns initially, but realistically, I'd say it takes about 35, 36 or so. And that's kind of like the average. You can do it faster, though. Um, one of the things I would prioritize is Fain uh, because of the control, specifically because uh, you want, if you, even if with, you get a really good Age of Reckoning and you get that control benefit, you're going to have so many confederations by. Uh, the mid late game that you're going to be constantly losing control because of that so getting this helps out it's not so much the feign benefit though one of the things another thing that's particularly useful in this tree is getting the dragon so like you would want to of course get like of of loyalty then get feign authority and then you can decide or you could decide to go for the dragon slayer recruit rank and hero capacity over here but lose the control you are obviously not going to be able to unlock everything before you do those five bits of research because you get uh, you get free over here if you go for feign authority and of loyalty right and then yeah it would be you would be able to do it so you got to decide top or bottom bottom does also have autonomy of the holds and related families so that could be exceptionally useful um but it depends on like what you want to prioritize at that particular point of your campaign something that is certainly really good over here and the whole reason why the guilds are vastly better than the clans it's not because of these kind of benefits it's what you get here at the bottom and the there's now all three of them are worth it so 
2050 diplomatic relations with factions that already like you is not particularly important. The allegiance points is nice. But what is important over here is construction guilds. So you have a bunch of research early on that reduces construction time, especially provincial capitals. Then you have another research that gives you construction time minus one for all buildings. Combine this with other pieces of research, you're constructing every single building significantly faster. It does take a thousand gold, gold so you're going to want to save up on that. And one of the things I would say, don't spend your early of gold on the forge at all. The forge I would treat more as a luxury item when you're really late game, because unlocking this kind of research is a far bigger benefit. And then you have something that makes the dwarves incredible, the grand throne chamber. So you're already in a situation where you build stuff very quickly, you'll be able to build stuff cheaper as well. And you have income scalability in a dwarf campaign because you tr produce tr trade resources. But then you get population surplus plus two for newly captured settlements. And since most provinces are like free settlements in them, some four, some two, but mostly I'd say the average is free. That means you can get like anywhere between four to eight population surplus in the provinces that you capture. And so the dwarf play style in terms of territorial capture, you don't want... Like, if you're playing a dwarf campaign, you don't want to sack settlements, necessarily. At least when, you, when you're getting that research. Um, what you want to do, really, because of the way dwarves work, you just either want to occupy settlements, or you want to loot and occupy. You will get rebellions because of that. Mind you, don't do it in every settlement, because it's not really worth it sometimes, unless you, you know, want to abuse that rebellion. Um, but you end up in the situation loot to occupy, get a rebellion, um, stabilize the provincial control, and because you can, uh, and, and you want to capture settlements as uh, as a high tier as possible. That's the reason why you want to loot and occupy, uh, and not sack. That's how it just works there. Otherwise, you'd sack. So you're not Greenskin, you're not Skaven, you're not Castorves in that respect. Well, cast, yeah, Castorves do want to sack because if they're building up a provincial capital, they'll benefit from sacking it because they will start from tier 1 anyway unless they spend influence when they capture a settlement, a provincial capital settlement. So that's the difference with Dwarves. Dwarves are, like other factions that are really good, are about tearing it down. Dwarves are about building it up. Really feels like restoring the realm from that perspective and all that research from guilds also meshes very well with the dwarf economy so the toolmakers guild toll giving you up to minus 15 percent construction cost for all buildings in a local province stacking in settlements is an incredible economic benefit furthermore you get trade resource production through dwarf beer high elves are better at trade income they have more benefits than you can get as the dwarves but the fact that you have an economic building that gives you construction cost benefits, it's kind of like mess, meshing together some of the better parts of both the High Elves and Cafe. Like Cafe has real significant construction cost benefits. High Elves have that trade resource production. You don't necessarily exceed either of them in, in these respects. You're not going to have as uh, many trade resources the high elves because their base economic structure increases trade resources nor are you going to have the construction cost benefits of cafe but what you are going to have is both construction cost benefits and trade resource production which means your income can genuinely of the order faction can end up being probably one of the highest in the entire game like I, I've had faction, like I've had campaigns as dwarves where I was generally like a hundred K plus by like turn 60, 50 to 60. And it is because of the research combined with the way the dwarf economy works. And obviously the military benefits are useful, but more in the long term as opposed to the short term. That's how I would view the dwarf research situation. Kwasin here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.